This lesson deals with supplemental problem 7.3. You can find this problem in the ECE 201 ebook in the chapter 7 supplemental problem starting on page 6. The schematic shown below here is that of an electronic flash of an old film camera. The way it works is there was a battery that charged up a capacitor and then the shutter is a single pole double throw switch that when you press the shutter it takes the capacitor and puts it across a flash bulb. The flash bulb is a bulb that consists of many strands of fine wire looks pretty much like steel wool. It's mixed with a chemical like magnesium. When you apply voltage across the steel wool, it ignites and it sets off a chemical reaction and you get a one-time flash of light. These types of camera were used up to about the 1970s and they were replaced by electronic flashes. Let's find the voltage across the capacitor, the current into the capacitor, and the current in the bulb for all time. Now let's ask ourselves why is a capacitor being used and not just a direct connection between the battery and the bulb. Well first let's solve for these variables and let's see if we can figure out why. We have a one capacitor circuit which is a first order differential equation so the form of the solution is some a plus b times e to the minus t over tau for any voltage or any current. We have three things that we're solving for so let's use three subscripts. Our second step is to find the pre-switching conditions of our three variables and so with the switch in this initial position for a long time, we'll assume the capacitor has reached steady state, and so no current is flowing, and so there's no drop across this resistor, and so the voltage of the battery is across the capacitor. Current in the capacitor is zero, and the current in the bulb is zero because they have an open circuit here. Our next step is to find the initial conditions. The voltage across the capacitor was 3.2 volts prior to the switch switching, and this is really the shutter being activated. And so the voltage is still 3.2 volts. And that's going to be A1 plus B1 times E to the zero. The current in the capacitor and the current in the bulb are related to each other, the negative of each other. Now let's, let's find the current in the bulb. The 3.2 volts is across the resistance of the bulb. I took some measurements on one of these flash bulbs and estimated the resistance to be about 0.7 ohms. When current starts to flow in these strands of wire, they ignite and they set off the chemical reaction with the magnesium and then gives a flash of light. So it lasts about a half a second. I'll use that to do some calculations. The current's going to flow in this bulb is going to be the 3.2 volts divided by the 0.7 ohms, and that's about 4.57 amps. And that's going to be our A3 plus B3 times E to the zero. Current in the capacitor is the negative of the current in the bulb, and so it's be a negative 4.57, and that's going to be A2 plus B2 times E to the zero. Since I have two unknowns for each equation, I need one more set of conditions and take a look at as t approaches infinity. So assuming that we're in this switch position for a long time, the capacitor is again an open circuit, and that means that no current is flowing, and therefore the current in the bulb is zero, and therefore the current in the capacitor is also zero. With no current in the circuit, then the voltage across the bulb is equal to zero, and that would be also the voltage across the capacitor. So the capacitor voltage will then be A1 plus B1 times E to the minus infinity over tau, or just A1. The current in the bulb will be also zero, and that's equal to A3 plus B3 times E to the minus infinity over tau. And then lastly, the capacitor current is also zero, and that would be A2 plus B2 times E to the minus infinity over tau. Okay, so we've got values for the A's, and then we can solve for B. The Thevenin resistance seen looking back from the capacitor when the switch is in this position is just equal to the 0.7 ohms. Now again, this is not going to last very long, but uh, our equations don't know that. So we're going to calculate the results as if that resistor were going to stay there for a long time. But our time constant is 0.7 times the capacitor value. I was able to measure the capacitor. It's around 1 microfarad. You get about 700 nanoseconds. This model for the battery, I should maybe mention, is a set of numbers I picked up from a handbook. This is two one and a half volt batteries, but when they're fully charged, a little bit higher than one and a half volts. In the ECE203 lab, we're actually going to measure a battery's Thevenin resistance. Let's do our sixth step, which is to find the solutions. So with the A's being equal to zero, then we just simply have our A plus B just equal to B. So the capacitor voltage then is just 3.2 volts times E to the minus T over tau, which is 700 nanoseconds. For t less than zero, that was equal to 3.2. So again, we have continuity, the capacitor voltage. So we start out at 3.2, and then we exponentially decay uh, in about three and a half microseconds. Remember, the bulb is only going to last a half a second or so, but, but this is all going to be over very quickly. The capacitor current is going to be our A plus B, but our A's are equal to zero, so it's just the B term. That was minus 4.57 amps, and again, times e to the minus t over tau, was equal to zero prior to the switch switching. 
we jump from zero to minus 4.57. That means that current is coming out of the capacitor and it basically dies off in three and a half microseconds. The bulb, again, is gonna be some A plus B times E to the minus T over tau. But again, our, our A term is zero, so we just have the B, which is equal to 4.57. And the current was zero prior to the shutter being activated. So we go from zero to 4.57 and then discharge to zero in about three and a half microseconds. This amount of current gets the wire and the flash bulb to ignite, it starts a chemical reaction. So this is over in three and a half microseconds, but that chemical reaction will last about a half a second. Suppose that we connect the bulb directly to the battery without using the capacitor. Let's see if we figure out what's going on. So the shutter just closed. I've got my battery voltage and a thevenin resistance, and now the resistance of the bulb. So the current coming out of here then would be the 3.2 volts divided by the total resistance of these two added together. That's about 2.13 amps. Now it took about a half a second for the wires to melt, and what happens is that this becomes an open circuit. I'm going to treat the bulb resistance as if it were constant during that interval of time, but it probably is changing. How much energy is this battery giving up during that half a second? Well, you know the voltage and you know approximately the current. So we're going to integrate that from zero to one half second. Now the voltage and the current are constant, so we're going to pull it out in front, not a function of time. And then we're going to take the integral of one dt, which is just t, evaluate the upper limit minus the lower limit, so just a half. So the product of the voltage and the current and then half a second would be about 3.41 joules. That's quite a bit of energy to give up from the battery. The capacitor got 3.2 volts across it. But if we know the capacitor voltage, we can calculate the amount of energy that's stored in it. And that's one half CV squared from our chapter six formulas. So I have one microfarad, 3.2 volts squared times a half, and that's only 5.12 microjoules. Now that's the energy in the capacitor, and that's all that the bulb could get when we connected the bulb across the capacitor. So we're, we're expending about one six hundred thousandth the energy that we were just a direct connection. And that's why this capacitor was used as a storage tank. I want to show you one more thing, and that is that when you charge the capacitor back up, you're actually going to expend more than this amount of energy to put that in the capacitor. Let's do the following. Let's let the shutter reset itself. It's going to go back to this position, and I'm going to get the value of the current needed to charge this capacitor up, and then we can take the same integral again and see what happens in terms of the energy that's given up by the battery to recharge the capacitor. I just wrote down the answer for the current coming out of the battery, but let me show you how I did this. When the switch is in this position, we're gonna have a first order differential equation. Again, A plus B times E to the minus T minus T zero divided by tau. What's the value of that current? Well, because the voltage here is zero, we'll have all of the 3.2 volts across the 0.8 volt. So the value of A plus B then is 3.2 divided by 0 0.8. Now as T approaches infinity, this capacitor will become an open circuit. Again, the switch in this position. And so the current will go to zero. So the value of A is equal to zero. So A plus B is just the value of B which is 3.2 divided by 0.8, delaying our start here by T0. And then our Thevenin resistance is just the 0.8 ohms times the one microfarad. So I have my equation for the current. Now let's take that current and multiply it by the battery voltage and then integrate that from T0 to infinity, or really just five time constants. The 3.2 and then this value of current we can bring out in front because it's just a constant. And then the integral of E to the AX is one over A E to the AX. And so that's gonna be equal to one over 0.8 micro, which is just 0.8 micro, and here's the minus sign that goes with that. And then we repeat e to the ax here. We're going to evaluate this from t0 to infinity. When t is equal to infinity, we have e to the minus infinity, which is equal to 0. And then when t is equal to t0, we just have e to the 0, which is 1. So we end up getting the minus signs canceling here, and we get the 3.2 volts squared times the 1 microfarad. That's 10.24 microjoules. So in this example, it took twice as much energy generated to be able to store the 5.12 microjoules. Now, if you repeat this problem again, using a different value for R and a different value for C, you'll get the same result. So whatever you store in the capacitor, you'll have to generate twice as much. You do this problem symbolically and actually show that that's true. But these are the kind of things that we look for in circuit theory. We look for patterns in circuits and then try to generalize the results. And this is supplemental problem 7.3.